rappers who have hundreds of million dollars, and there's some rappers who are billionaires, but these leaders in entertainment allowed me, allowed me to join their team. And from that, I discovered also Positive K, went on to discover a lot of other rappers, but I was able to put the microphone down and pick up the pen. Because I realized the entertainment, the money, was not in the recording studio, was not on the stage. The real money was whoever was providing the opportunity, whoever was the purchaser of the talent, whoever controlled uh, the master, who, whoever controlled the publishing. And I realized that that door was open. So as an entertainer, I was able to engage with other people. And because I was able to communicate well, as an educated person, I was able to go behind the stage. I realized that the money that you're not making, somebody else is. <laughs> and most of the time, it's yours. Now, listen, listeners, the money you're not making, somebody else is. There's a, there's a take home. There's a take home. And oftentimes, it's yours. In today's ultra-competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Well, hey there, I'm The Real Jason Duncan. Thanks for tuning in to the Root of All Success podcast where I study some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world and their rise to success. Thank you for joining me. If you're listening to this on any of the podcast players, I want to say thank you to C-Suite Radio Network, the world's largest business network radio platform that syndicates us internationally on every podcast player. So thank you to the C-Suite Radio Network for making the root of all success able that you can listen to it wherever you're listening to this. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, it, you, I really am glad that you're watching it because we're sitting in the Rhino Room at the Standard at the Smith House. It's a house that was built in 1843. It's 18,000 square feet of Southern sophistication and style. And watching this on YouTube here in the Rhino Room, it's just, you gotta see this. And if you ever come to Nashville, you absolutely have to look me up and say, hey man, let's go get a cigar and a glass of whiskey at the Standard because it's a wonderful place. It's owned and operated by the one and only Joshua Sterling Smith, who's a good friend of mine. And I'm honored to be a member here at the Standard. And I'm honored that he allows me to record this podcast right here here in the standard and I get to meet some amazing people like our guest today that I'm going to introduce here in just a minute. But before we get into the guest today, I want to tell you who's sponsoring this episode. And I want to tell you who's sponsoring it by asking you this question. As a small business owner, do you get tired of not having the data in front of you that you need to see? Are the CRMs that you're using, are they absolutely more bells and whistles than you need? And it's just too much stuff, too many clutters, and you end up reverting back to Excel <laughs> to find the crap that you need to run your business? Well, you like me and everybody else out there dealt with the same stuff. We went through three or four different CRMs at one of the companies I own before we found Nurture. Nurture360 is an amazing platform. You need to go to nurture360.com slash root. That's nurture, N-E-R-C-H-E-R, 360.com slash root, as in root of all success, for a special offer. When I found Nurture and I brought it into one of my big companies and I introduced it to my sales team and to my production team, they were like, this is amazing. Because it has dashboards right there on the screen. You don't have to run reports. It's everything you need. None of the bells and whistles and all the BS that all these big CRMs put out there and say, hey, we can make coffee for you too. I don't need you to make coffee for me. I just need the data where I can see it, right? And it, the cool thing about it too is it actually shows you on stages through the sales process your percentage closing from stage to stage and we had been doing that for years using Excel no other CRM did that nurture 360 does it go to nerchr 360.com slash root for a special offer and make sure you tell them you heard about them here on the root of all success all right so enough with all of that let me tell you about our guest today I can't tell you how excited I am to have this guy sitting across from me 
And uh, if you if you haven't if you're not watching this on YouTube, you at least got to go look how cool this dude looks on YouTube. Just for a minute, just go look at it and look at how cool he is, man. So so this guy I was introduced to through a mutual friend of ours, a guy that knows him and a guy that knows me. He was kind of the triangle point that pulled us together, and we met in person for the very first time last night and had dinner here at the Standard, and had a phenomenal evening talking about all things related to success, entrepreneurialism, hip hop music, anything you can imagine, this guy has been involved in. So our guest today got his start in Brooklyn, uh, and when he was a kid, he and his brother found themselves dealing with uh, their mom's nervous breakdown and, and them being having to live in a shelter for a while, and he just vowed as a young kid that he's never going to live in that circumstance again, and certainly, he didn't ever live in that circumstance again, which you'll learn a lot about his success as we go through the show today. But he went from there, he got, into, he got involved in hip hop. Even, even in the 70s, he was figuring out how to get into a music genre that didn't exist. And he was one of the pioneers of hip hop, ultimately went on, even though he had his own deal, which he'll talk about later, went on to manage superstars like Jason Mitchell and LL Cool J. I mean, these are, these are phenomenal guys that you know about. He was involved in managing their careers. He was also a sports agent, managed people like Asante Samuel. Uh, there's, a, there's other people on that list that he's gonna talk about. I, that's the one I remember, because that's the most famous one. He did a huge deal, it was like $62 million with Asante Samuel. This guy's been on ESPN, he's been on television shows, he's won uh, humanitarian awards from different countries. He's got an honorary doctorate degree from uh, Nepal Kathmandu Institute. He, this guy is unbelievable, and he's also super humble about it. Like, uh, like, like he, you, you wouldn't know this. Like, you got to sit down and talk to him, which is why we're going to have him on the show today and talk about his level of success and what he's adding back. And the, probably the pinnacle of his entire achievement, I think that he would agree, is the Book Bank Foundation. He started, he started that in 1998. And we're going to talk about what that does, but he's helped over 175,000 children worldwide get access to literature, literacy training, and he's donated, helped help donate over half a billion hours of community service through his organizations. I want to introduce you to my new friend, and I think we're going to be great friends long term because this guy's going places, even still going more places. I'm honored to have the one and only Dr. Glenn Toby here on my show. Glenn, this is great. I'm so happy you're here, man. So I got to ask, hip hop, how in the world did you come up with that? You're one of the pioneers, right? You, yeah. you came up with that. So like, how did that happen? Well, it started in the Bronx, uh, Cool Herc and the pioneers that were Africa Bambada. And the, this was an amazing art form. Uh, it really started because it was kind of, a, it was a concept, right? It was graffiti, b-boying, which is dancing. DJing, rapping, the culture as itself. So in Queens, in the outer borough, we had DJ sets, we had rappers who didn't have, records weren't out at this time either. So I was called Sweetie G, and I was a local rapper. I made mixtapes. These tapes were passed around locally through schools, through the community. It started to move around. Then people like Grandmaster Flash and uh, these great rappers that you know uh, I guess you'd know LL Cool J, Run DMC. They came a little bit after I was I was an emerging artist, right? I'd never had the big records that they had, but I had the passion and I toured with everybody from Biz Markie, uh, Dougie Fresh, Grandmaster Flash, as I said, the Curtis Blows of the world. And then as hip hop took off and became more commercialized, I didn't like the deals they were giving out, like at Sugar Hill Gang, um, and you had Grandmaster Flash who did some time over there. I didn't care for those deals. I was really business driven because I felt I had a responsibility to my family. My grandmother was still alive. My mother and my grandmother gave us this great opportunity, my brother and myself, and I felt as though there was a responsibility uh, to focus on business, community, and having a legacy offering to the world and what I did, not just the entertainment side of it. So I kind of left that a little bit prematurely. Still was involved in business in many ways, um, whereas I went the corporate route and from corporate um, I bounced around and started creating businesses, creating ideas with my vision and developing to what we do as entrepreneurs today. So how did you, so moving from hip hop to entrepreneurialism and corporate, corporate life, what was the spark that made you say, I, there's more to just being the performer, I want to be behind the scenes creating business. So then that entrepreneurial journey, where did that start for you? 
it was by it was by necessity. So as an artist, I was making a lot of money, maybe a thousand dollars, five hundred dollars then at a time with no records out. There were no hip hop records released at that time. Then the emergence when Run DMC came and and did it's like that when Curtis Blow came with Breaking these massive records came and between that period of time to where Beastie Boys came and everybody else I realized I'm not going to be able to compete with these people at this level so I said where do I go I'm in the middle of the water I have this talent I was a promoter with Mike and Dave uh, and I would travel all throughout the city and I think it was fear it was fear but no panic and that fear created an awareness that I thought of first I have this passion and I needed to have a purpose I went from passion to purpose to profit. And when you think of profit, you think about money. I thought about prophecy, which was prophetic, right? Which is a divine, innate ability to say, God gave me this opportunity to be a business person. And I went through some tough communities and tough times. You know, as a child homeless from eight years old to seventh grade, adversity was something that I didn't fear. I embraced it sort of like taking the medicine and knowing the medicine's part of the cure. So I just looked at the world differently. I took all of these obstacles that I transformed in my life. No, no means what? New opportunity, right? In every <laughs> single way. That's good. So I just felt that, hey, I have the music. This is not going to sustain. I'm not willing to give away my publishing. I don't want to be an artist that travels all their life. I had all these ideas. I was very, uh, I was an idea guy. I was a visionary guy from the reading, right? When I'm homeless as a child, my brother and I would be in reading contests and education was so important to us. I had so many ideas and so many thoughts and so many concepts that microphone and music would, wasn't enough. So I had to find other platforms. Well, so I think that the no meaning new opportunity is pretty cool. You said something when we were talking last night that, that you didn't use that phrase, but you said, you know, I grew up, I was homeless for a while, lived in shelters. Obviously, you've made it with lots of zeros on the end, right? You, you, you escaped all of that, overcame it in spite of it. But you said something last night that I think is interesting I would like to, I would like to chat about for just a minute. You said, man, I had this experience that was absolutely terrible and in many ways traumatic, like with your mom's breakdown and, and the shelter and the whole thing, living with your grandmother and your mom. Like that, that made you, like click something in your brain that said, I'm going to use this negative experience for something greater. Why do so many people deal with those negative experiences and don't come out of that with a positive mental attitude like you did? Why do you think that is? Well, I, I was raised with a strong spiritual background. You know, the Lord was the king in my house, raised by two women. My father was not available. And the way I thought to reward my parents and reward my mother would be behavior, patience, and... You know, when you're living in hotels bouncing around as a child, when you're living um, off of public assistance and with family members, you know, so thank God I was never abused, no one was hurt. I was in a time where I think more so now than ever, people read more, people listened to each other, communication was a little bit different, the ecosystems were not as vast, the global uh, influences from the world on a social economic level were not as direct and demanding as they are now. You didn't have a, a, a cell phone every second. People are looking at it, and there's new ideas being forced on your children or on your community. So I was able to look at the resolute reality. My reality for a child at the age of eight to seven would be comparable to somebody double my age. When you're sitting for 11 hours in a day, wondering if your mother's going to come home, staying patient, because my mother, she wouldn't sell her body. She wasn't on drugs. Uh, but dementia sets in when you're homeless. I come home, all my toys, furniture, everything's put in the street. Something clicked in me saying, remain obedient, stay calm because everybody else is calm. I trusted in them, trusted in the Lord. I didn't know the words, I didn't know what it was, but there was a resolute spirit that was opened. When, there, when all the doors shut, I became the key to my own universe. I didn't know where the key was, I didn't know what it looked like. I was the key to my solutions. And then when things didn't work, I had resolutions, resolutions, resolve, return to the inner me, return to everything they taught me because I could not afford to lose. Ah, oh, man, that's good. That is so good. So many people don't do that. They, they, they internalize all those things. They play the victim. 
and like oh, bad stuff happened to me, the world owes me everything, and yet you aren't doing that. You didn't do that, and look where you're at now. I mean, you're a very wealthy man. You're connected like nobody's business, and you're not only, it's not just wealth in terms of financial things. It's like what your impact on the world through through things that you've been doing is phenomenal. Tell me, tell me about. Uh, I want to I want to talk about the sports agency, but before we talk about that, I want to talk about Book Bank Foundation because I know that's a big, close to your heart initiative that's been going on for what, thirty years? Twenty. Twenty, 20, years, 20 yeah. years. Man, that's a, that's a long time for something like that. So tell me what that is and what you're doing through that to impact the world. Well, and not to jump ahead, but it's funny you said that. One day I was sitting down. And I said, I wondered, I said, how did I earn this money? And I looked at the house that I had. Um, it was 12,500 square feet, I'm driving the best of cars, traveling first class, handmade clothing, um, maybe popular, maybe famous. I don't know if I want to use those terms, right? But I'm in magazines on television. I think I'd done um, everything that I wanted to do. I reached a certain number and I had all these material things and I said, how did I get here? And I would ask. I would do self-examination and talk to spiritual leaders and family members. And people say, the Lord blessed you. I know the Lord blessed me, but, you know, you have to take action. You know, you can't just sit there and wait for the lottery ticket. So I said it was constantly reading. I was a voracious reader. I was reading the Wall Street Journal when I was in the seventh grade. Um, I knew what Dun & Bradstreet was. When I used to get my homework assignments, not only would I read the textbook, but I would try to go on and watch TV, this is in middle school, and look at newspapers and ask questions within my house and out my house. I'm almost really interviewing people. Somebody had an amazing job, I would ask them all about it. So I said it was education. So I do believe that education is the key and a lack of education. I'd say illiteracy, a lack of education is the first step into incarceration, drug abuse, the economic gap, dissonance, a lack of communication, and a sovereign mind of naught. Meaning that every single thing that you put into the equation of changing yourself in the world is based on your own experience, a myopic view of the world, not having these um, critical thinking sessions, talking to your peers, people that you like and don't like. More specifically, people have these barriers and these challenges with race, with economics, with opinions, with choice. Well, you know, the more resolute you are to changing your life or having an impact on others is having the discipline and the skill set to take verbal attacks, accusations, indifference. You know, if you're bringing a complete person or someone that's complete enough to be invited into other spaces, you're going to get all of the jewels. Somebody could be completely wrong. You're going to learn from that. Self-discovery and discovering other things. Uh, so I always saw it as... When I was a kid, I remember somebody said, look, look at those homeless people over there. And my brother and I would look. We didn't know who the, I think they said bums. Look at those bums over there. Look at those hobos. It was something crazy. We didn't even look. We didn't know they were talking about us. The garments didn't affect us. Where we lived didn't affect us. We knew it was temporary. We know where we came from. We came from grace and love and common sense. And we dreamed big. That dreaming was, was so massive. I was forced to sit every day and make a TV in my head. There was no TV. There may not be a book. I had to dig deep. So where did the Book Bank Foundation come from? Was it that desire to give other people the opportunity to have literacy? Yeah, just saying, hey, if you look at some of the cognitive challenges, personal experiences, and can numb them out or not be an emotional thinker and resonate and, and be a pure soul, it's like two glasses of water together. If you tap one, the other one moves, it's resonation. If you can do it in the spiritual, you can do it in the physical, you can do it in the financial, and you can overcome every single challenge. You may not come out winning, but you'll never lose. So your, your career as an entrepreneur started with the recording studio in Queens, right? And that led you into meeting superstars. Yeah, meeting superstars like LL Cool J. And I think we, I think anybody in my generation, because uh, we're we're a little bit different in age, but in my generation certainly remembers uh, LL Cool J's first couple of albums. And and man, I Need Love was one of my favorite songs. My wife and I just celebrated our 30th anniversary of our first date, and we were both listening to that song back when we were dating. Like it's, and it was it was an impactful song. And you were involved in that 
era and as, as, as an entrepreneur, right? As an entrepreneur, more so there because I, Sweetie G had just ended and Brian Latour, who's LL Cool J's first manager, Charles Fisher, and I joined the team with that team. And team is so important, right? Most of your most success, successful businesses, they're all cooperative, uh, they're self-built. So these guys that I grew up in the neighborhood brought me to bring my ideas. My interpretation of a successful artist was someone that could do business and would go into other areas. We didn't, we didn't know that it would end up being a multi-billion dollar business where you have rappers who have hundreds of million dollars and there's some rappers who are billionaires, but these leaders in entertainment allowed me, allowed me to join their team. And from that, I discovered also Positive K, went on to discover a lot of other rappers, but I was able to put the microphone down and pick up the pen because I realized the entertainment, the money, was not in the recording studio, was not on the stage. The real money was whoever was providing the opportunity, whoever was the purchaser of the talent, whoever controlled uh, the master, who, whoever controlled the publishing. And I realized that that door was open. So as an entertainer, I was able to engage with other people. And because I was able to communicate well, as an educated person, I was able to go behind the stage. I realized that the money that you're not making, somebody else is. <laughs> and most of the time it's yours. Now, listen, listeners, the money you're not making, somebody else is. There's a, there's a take home. There's a take home. And oftentimes it's yours. Yeah. So how did you get into sports agency? That sounds completely different. Is it completely different or is it, am I wrong about that? That's interesting. So that was the uh, platform. That was the premise of the thesis of my business. I discovered a guy by the name of David Banner from a group called Crooked Letters. Met this young agent called Alonzo Shavers. Um, I was talking to him, sort of a mentorship, a brilliant guy, he was an athlete at Ohio State, and I invested time and money into this business that he had. We did a co-partnership, struggled to make it along the way. We ended up getting this guy, Asante Samuel, who ended up, we ended up negotiating a $62 million deal, moving him from New England Patriots to uh, Philadelphia Eagles. But I had several other athletes that I had great relationships with, from Damian Robinson, um, who I'm still wonderful, he's just a great a brother of mine, uh, Josh Evans, Antonio Freeman, I just, we did countless artists, uh, athletic artists, I call them because they are artists, they're performing artists, they just have on suits, some have on helmets, some are playing in their underwear, which we call shorts, <laughs> and I feel the music, there's a synergy, because most rappers and singers want to be athletes, most athletes and entertainers want to be business people. So there's this whole triangle of sorts, right? So I figured if I took the flair, the excitement, the energy, and the sexiness of entertainment and merged it with the National Football League, which is like the U.S. military, governance, rules, discipline. Most of these kids go to school two to four years. So if I could make a hybrid of that, that would give us the flair. And that's the name came up, Celebrity Sports Agent. Because me as a celebrity in the celebrity world, came to sports, hence Stephen A. Smith, my appearance on ESPN, and it just took off like wildfire. And we just continued to rinse and repeat, wash, rinse and repeat. So you had the, the you had your own hip hop career, you had your, your record label, you know, produce, production company that you were doing. You started uh, a, a, a celebrity sports agent and Bookbank Foundation. What other entrepreneurial ventures have you been involved in? Well, obviously, I was investing the money that I earned. I've been really, I've been looking at stocks. You know, as a as a child, um, I always would research stocks and bonds. I was obsessed with Wall Street. My mother worked in the office. Where as a child, when I was eight years old, I used to go to her job, and I would watch these businessmen. I would watch these business people, and something tapped in my spirit, and I said, I want to be this guy with a wall with in Wall Street or in a business office, I want to wear a suit every day, I want to have a briefcase, uh, I want to have an office, and it was in my spirit, I didn't know it. Some people are attracted to music as a kid. Music, I found, is just a passion, it was a way for me to communicate, because hip hop, rap. And then from rap, you know, as, as we uh, discussed last night, I'm one of the founders of a New York City garage house music, which is dance music. So these are all creative outlets, but it's all communication which would later be a platform and a driver for me to go into business and create other opportunities, right? Real estate, I'm in the tech, tech world. We're doing education at Bookbank Institute. 
I have friends like you who are changing the world, entrepreneurs who are doing 10x on businesses, our buddy Dan Vega and all these other wealthy people around the world, these global leaders. I have a voice to communicate with them, not just because of money, but because of ecosystems I've created, art, music, film, entertainment, and core business. Yeah. So we continue to have fun and play with each other and build up things and have fun and create commerce and wealth and share it with the world. So how would, how would you, and I'll ask this of every guest, so Glenn, I mean, you know, from the outside looking in, people would look at you and go, hey, you're a successful guy. So, but how would you define that word success? Success is when someone saw value in you, somebody made a sacrifice, somebody thought you were worth more than what they would become, and they have a kind heart to advance you. Or they're afraid of you that you're gonna put them out of business but they know you have enough merit and character and grace that you'll be honorable enough to share what you're making or honor the side of the road you're going to be on. When you collect these experiences, these people, these opportunities over and over again, you return something back from where you take from. Now with that in mind, do you consider yourself successful? I've had success and I'm being successful each day in what I'm supposed to do, but it's never good enough. When I'm successful, it means I'm full. I'm full of all the wins. So I'm a champion. I'm not necessarily a winner or a loser. I have been victorious many times. I've always said I have been able to champion the losses and sustain so many losses that the losers can resonate in me because I'm a graceful, good winner. I come back and I realize this guy can eat my lunch tomorrow. The winners who have integrity, who have purpose, and understand that the victors are supposed to help others. The winners are here to help the losers. We're all winners. As many times as I've been in competitive situations and I didn't get the best of it, I came away with an experience. I came away with uh, measures of how I lost. I looked at the game film with no tape in the camera. The guy that beat me never defeated me because I brought back grace and integrity and purpose. Every room you walk in, you gotta bring something to it, because when I leave that room, you'll know I'm there. And every step of my life that I've walked away, someone knows I, I was there. If I made a mistake, and they're kind enough to tell me I made a mistake, if it was an experience that wasn't so good, either I would look back at it, and I'd be rewarded by the continued relationship, or with a ton of money, and the relationship goes bad. But that integrity never took me out of the game. That's why I'm sitting here with you, brother. <laughs> well, I'm a, it's an honor. It's an honor to get to know you and hear this story. Um, what I, what I want to talk about now is I want to dial in on the success thing because this is the root of all success after all. And I want to talk about that, that term success. So dictionary definition of success is the, achieving the result you hope for. So really success is about results. So in, in terms of, Hey, I want to give 175,000 children literacy training. That's my goal. You achieve the goal. You're successful dictionary definition. And I appreciate the humility and well, you know, I've had success and I'm, you know, I'm still working towards it. I, I think, I think a lot of people who sit across from me on the couch say similar things like, well, I've had it. I'm aiming for it. Some people come out and say, yeah, I'm successful hundred percent. But, but all of us are coming from the same perspective that it's, I achieved something I was hoping to achieve. Yeah. What's funny to me, what's very interesting. And the reason I started this show is that I had sat not only here at the standard, but in many other places as Myself, an accidental entrepreneur who'd, who'd experienced success and, you know, been recognized by Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine and other, other articles, other, other business articles and journals, I, I started interviewing very casually other successful entrepreneurs that I thought were more successful than me. How did you do it? How did you do it? What did you do? And what I found is that these five things showed up in everybody's story. And I want to test my theory on you. I want to see if these five things showed up in your... The first one's passion. Now, a lot of people think that when I say passion, it's excitement like I'm sure at some point you were so excited and passionate about hip-hop that you couldn't stand see straight like it right. was it was you right. you had you were the performer you were sweetie G wow. you were on the mic and you were wow. mixing it up and yes, I watched sir. a couple of your YouTube videos uh -oh. it's funny. well it's actually just audio over a record album label right. you know so but it's really cool you should go look it up but but that's that's one side of passion and certainly that contributes to success but the thing I found that is most uh, the, the biggest part of contributing to success from a passion perspective is the word passion means being willing to suffer. So it's the, it's the mental side of passion. 
The emotional is the happiness and the joy and the excitement, but the mental side of passion, willing to suffer, that's why we call it the passion of the Christ. It wasn't he was excited to go to the cross, it was he was willing to endure it for a greater cause. And I find that that's the number one indicator of success for entrepreneurs is they're willing to push through the you know what, the crap, the dung, the, you know, you know, the, the bad stuff. Where did that show up in your story? I never paid it attention. I had such adversity from a, a young age. I was able to block out the noise. Um, I, I didn't want a lot. I wanted my own bed because I was without my own bed, without new clothes. So my desires were not greater um, than my focus. Some people's desires are so big, they're missing the focus. They have to refocus constantly. So I was just focused on staying in the game, not necessarily winning the game. And then I realized people that didn't have some of the principles, didn't have some of the tools, and didn't have some of the similar ideology would just fall right out, crap right out of the, the game. So I said, wait, I don't have to work so hard. I just have to be consistent. I don't have to get a knockout. I just have to get on base. I don't have to have a grand slam. So I was moderate in it. And I wasn't afraid to lose. And I didn't um, score every victory as mine. I was always concerned about when will this greatness end. So my ultimate goal in life is to die greater than I have lived. If I've lived this good, I'm going to die greater. Someone will know me when I'm gone. Someone will think about me for a second. I never wanted to be that guy. I didn't want to be on American Greed. Didn't want to be in a federal prison talking about how smart I am and witty I am. And every birthday, every year, every day, uh, you realize that God's granted me another day to get it right, and I look at what I didn't do right. And that's where you have to be a bit reserved. And I realize it's great people in my life. Richard Dwayne Britt, a dear friend, this young man named David Branch that running BookBank Foundation as a CEO, and countless people that I can't even, man can't even mention, attorneys, uh, people who have stepped aside, that have retired early, or have shared their winnings with me. I have a responsibility to return. So much has been given to me. So the second thing that I see happening in everybody's story on their journey to success is being at the right place at the right time. And most entrepreneurs can point back to a specific place or a specific time. They're like, Man, have I, had I not been there, I would not be the person I am today. I would not be successful. Do you have a place? Wow. Nice one. Nice one, Jason. Wow. What a question. So it, it's... My angels show up. My brothers and sisters that I don't know from other tribes that I can't describe have always shown up for me. I think it's the grace of God that I found myself in other people. It's happened so many times I can't think of one moment specifically that was it. Because every time I have been assigned grace or assigned a duty or an obligation or an opportunity, I have reassigned myself to the responsibility of being worthy. Now, your mom, you guys were originally from the South, but ended up in yeah. Queens, right? Yeah. All right. The third P is people. And there's usually a person or two, whether it's a positive influence or a negative influence, that made you who you are. And I've got, you know, I've got somebody in my life that I think about, had that person not been there, I wouldn't be who I am today. Who is it for you? Who is it for Sweetie G? Who is it for Glenn Toby? Who, who helped make you who you are today? My grandmother with her prayer, she'd pray loud. My mother with her strength and resilience to come back from mental illness. I had, so transition from a kid that was bouncing around with relatives living in the street. I went to Queens Village Middle School, although born in Brooklyn, but my, my home at seventh grade on to today, I went to a middle school, uh, Queens Village Junior High, and there was a coach. I was rambunctious, aggressive, over competitive. And I remember he hugged me and patted me on the back and said, calm down. He patted me on the back and I went like this. It was almost a healing pat. And I think I took off for the rest of my life from there. Yeah, because you didn't have a dad around to do that, right? And didn't have a male embrace. Someone to pat me and say, hey, you can calm down. Because I was competing to win. I felt I had to win. And then I became more strategic and more compassionate because of the hug. What's his name? Do you remember his name? I don't remember. I used to remember it all the time, and it'll probably come back to me when I'm. Well, I had I had a I had another guest on the show who mentioned a teacher, and and in a similar in a similar thing, and I said, and, and I said I asked the same question, and they they knew who it was, and I said, have you told them that story? And they were like, no, I don't think I ever did. 
and you know, you're, you're, that guy may not be alive today, but, but their, their person was, and I think they went back later and said, hey, you were, you were the person for me. Had you not happened. I got that chance. I did that. And he lives, in, in, and everyone lives with it, and because we're mirrors of one another. And um, we are what we never want to be in somebody else or all we need to be. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> The fourth P, the fourth key of prep is preparation. And I look at this when I've studied all these entrepreneurs just like you who's super successful. They're never successful in something unless they were prepared for that thing. And like, I, I use this example probably too much, but like uh, Jeff Bezos and both Elon Musk, who are two of the titans of entrepreneurial world right now in our, in our culture, yeah. Yeah. they're preparing to go to the moon. Well, they couldn't go to the moon had they not been ready and prepared. You go back 25 years for either of them, going to the moon is, a, is so far out of the realm of co uh, concept and possibility it wouldn't have happened. Here's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer my question to you and then you tell me if I'm right. I think being homeless and your mom dealing with mental illness at a young age for you, when you were young, prepared you for everything you've experienced in life and you wouldn't be successful without it. Like if your mom had been normal, well-adjusted, probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to me right now. What, what do you think, is it true? Appreciate it, it's, a, it's completely, the truth, but I think it is divine, God's divine grace because to come with such a challenge so early and the way we adapted, I didn't go to prison for 25 years, wasn't a drug addict, never had a nervous breakdown, have been able to, I mean, I speak multiple languages, I travel the globe, I've been able to put my fingerprint on, on so many startup opportunities, businesses, things in culture, so I know that's exactly right. But I think what I would add to that is I became successful out of fear. Don't want to be poor again. Don't want to be homeless. I got to win. It's like a dog is chasing it. They say, I'm, they'd say, why do you, in sports, why do you run like this? Why do you move like this? Why do you compete like this? You know, and I'd say, because I always pretend like I'm going to be homeless on the next deal or a dog is chasing me. I'm going at it. Let me tell you something. That fear drove me so far to success. I was so far behind young, I thought, in the material things, but I was really ahead. I was pre-prepared. Pre-prepared, right? So in this preparation, I realized I had so much success, I looked around and I was in rooms, you know, whether I'm teaching at Harvard, like you mentioned, teaching at these schools and leading um, fellowship and, um, with my brothers and sisters who are successful in all walks of life. And I said, I don't want to be so far ahead I'm alone. I don't want to be so successful that I'm the richest or smartest guy in the room and nobody wants to see me. I don't want to have a funeral that they don't even need to print anything up because nobody's coming. They won't even tune in online. Tone it down, take it in, be measurable. And one of the things that I say is, what would we do as human beings if we had to be worthy of each breath we take? From the inhale, I don't get to exhale unless I'm worthy in God's grace and to humanity and purpose-filled. Something I've got to do or something I'm going to do would allow me to exhale again. And every second I've got to be worthy of my time on this planet. That's heavy. Started measuring myself about two decades like that, making everything count. And instead of running from the dog, I was out running the devil staying in God's grace, trying to stay in the light, and knowing when the temperature changes, making the necessary adjustments. If it's too hot, the air conditioning isn't working, get out of the room. Air conditioning's too cold, turn it down. Don't like who I'm riding with, walk. What's tougher than being a homeless kid from eight years old to seventh grade? Nothing. It's not that tough. <laughs> Preparation, man. Everybody's got it. So the fifth P is plan. And plan, you know, a lot of people think, well, you're talking to entrepreneurs who had a business plan. They put together a, a, a lock solid business plan and made millions. That's not it. Plan is, what is your strategy to deploy the financial resources required to be successful? Now, you've been, you're, you're a wealthy guy, very successful m with money, right? Successful with things. I mean, you, real estate and stocks and finances, you've done well. Was there, a, was there a time at which you were like, okay, how do I open the recording studio? Where do I get the cash to do this? How do I do this? I'm sure there was a time where you were like, how do I get the money? Or did Sweetie G make so much money with that first mixtape, you didn't ever have to worry about money? Tell me how that worked. So again, communications. This microphone is magic. I always made a correlation to a minister. 
to a politician, to the town crier. I would watch the black and white movies. I would watch, <laughs> read books and stories, and that town crier, whether it was the I'd even hear when I'd go to the ballpark, peanuts, get your peanuts here, cook a car. It was just, wow, man, look at that song. Look at the way he's rapping. So my gift was in communication. If I could resonate with a crowd and get them to put, put your hands up in the air, somebody say, yeah, just communicating and being able to get people to give me their time, their money, their interest, their passion, their talent. Wow, I'm able to do that. But I don't want to be the guy that gets run out of town when everybody gives me everything, right? <laughs> so I got to make sure that everything's right. So it was easy to get people to invest in me. And some of these people were relatives and some of these were people that were in businesses that weren't legal businesses. Nobody would ever say that. These weren't legal businesses because unions, there was mob was involved, people sold drugs, people did all these kind of things. And I always thought about consciousness that it didn't feel good cheating. My grandmother was a spiritual woman. So if I was cheating or stealing or selling drugs, not only couldn't I go home, I wouldn't want to go home. Mm -hmm. So I've been involved with just people who were gracious and God has given me the, uh, the grace and the spirit that I can connect with other people that are the right people. And in that, I speak to the wrong people in my mission on earth, Book Bank Foundation, talking to the lost, the lonely, and the forgotten, and talking about my favor to my neighbor. But we give hand ups, not hand downs. Yeah, that was great. I've got, as you were sitting there talking and through, through meeting you last night and having dinner and then talking today, I've got, I don't know if this is crazy, but I could see, here's what I think, here's what I see, man. I see we rent out a roller skating rink, man. We rent out a roller skating rink and we invite all of the people that you know, the coolest people that you know, my network of clients and friends, and we get in this roller skating rink and we're playing some old Sweetie G. We're, we're playing some real old Grandmaster Flash and Curtis Blow. All right, so who, who's in your network? Who shows up for that? Who comes to this? Crazy. It could be... One of my, some of my friends that are billionaires. It could be our friend in common. Yeah. It could be, it would be a mayor of a city, a congressman, a movie star, a rapper, a singer, a minister, a judge. Could be a guy that was a drug dealer. Could be a guy that was on drugs. Could be a guy that was mentally ill. There'll be people that did 20, 30 years in prison. There'll be people that are thought leaders, iconoclasts. And we'll all be in there for a mission. The mission is what we do, changing the world one word at a time. Education or purpose filled. Now is the real work. Man, that'd be a fun party, man. It would be. Are we you good at roller skating? No, not right now. You know what's going on with this Achilles right now, man. <laughs> yeah, you didn't, mess, you didn't boot, you just messed up your foot. Well, I'm a killer roller skater, man. I, I, I worked at a roller skating rink when I was a kid, 16, 17 years old. I still have the skates wow. when I was a kid. And, and can you still go? I, can, I haven't done it in a long time, but every time I go, they're like, I can't believe that, that dude is doing that. <laughs> like I, could, I, I was pretty good as a roller skater. So I think we should do this. We should rent a roller skating rink. We should make that happen, man. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to do a joint event online. We're going to teach some people. Your systems are, are incredible. A lot of your viewers don't realize the advantage of taking some of your courses. I audit your courses. We're in clubs and social organizations that serve humanity together and bring grace and education together. We had, what I'm doing with uh, Dan Vega with the Book Bank Institute at Blue University, this education piece is amazing. You and I are going to do something together, and we'll do it virtually, and then we'll invite people because they're going to be in the room with us. We're yeah. going to show them how to make money and how to keep money and how to pass it off so that everybody in the village loves them. They won't kill the king. That's right, man. Well, wealth is the thing that makes the world go round. I mean, we, we get, it takes money to make this world happen, and the money in the right hands makes the world a better place. It does. It does. So we got a lot of people that listen to the show who are uh, entrepreneurs, and then who are extremely successful like you. We got people that are up and comers that are just starting out first two or three years in the game as business owners, entrepreneurs. And then we got people that are, are entrepreneurs. Man, they wanna do it. They haven't left their they haven't left their, their W two job. They're still working for the man, so to speak. As a matter of fact, I talked this morning with the with I, I do a free coaching session every week with somebody around the world and, and that guy, he was a, a firefighter EMT, but he's wanting to be an you know, an entrepreneur. So for that, for that guy, that girl who's out there listening right now to this show, they're walking the dog, they're on the treadmill, they're driving the car, getting coffee, whatever they're doing, 
and they're listening to you, who's, who's had an amazing career in so many different genres, so many different industries, know so many different people, and they want to know one piece of advice for that guy, that girl who hasn't started yet as an entrepreneur, what does Dr. Glenn Toby tell that guy? I'd like to tell them something different. Inspiration, act, believe in yourself, you've heard that. Let me tell you how I work, everything is now. So if I'm shooting a video, and I'm shooting a video, you and I are out in the town, we're doing a show, we're doing an event, we're doing one. So when I'm videoing you, the second the video ends, I drop it on your, hey, let me hand you this. I send it to my team, my partner. If something's supposed to be done, I do it within seconds. If I'm supposed to pull off, I'm not pulling off until it's done. Do everything now. There's no tomorrow. There are too many distractions. There are too many alerts that are coming on the cell phone. There's too much disruptive information. Cognitively, this, you know, we got all this news and data that comes across, and data points are critical to being successful in business. So if you can continuously put every task that you have to do immediately in front of you, forget taking that break, forget treating yourself, let me just take a minute and take, don't do anything until you've done everything that you can. Don't do anything until you've done everything that you can. Take away from those eight hours of rest and maybe take a quarter of that. Take one or two hours. And if you do that right, you'll have peace. Rest with no peace is nothing. But a peaceful rest is a man that stays ahead of the rest. I love it. A little sweetie G rhyme right there. Had to put it in. Had to put it in. <laughs> anything else you want to add to our discussion about success and your story and anything at all? Yeah, just as a summary, I think uh, my work, may, I pray that my work um, will speak for itself and it's easy to find me on social media or Google and look at my historicals or case studies. But I want to say to the world now, men, like, you know, I came in a long distance to come see you because of what you do, how you affect people. Um, as a core professional, your ecosystems are incredible. I borrow from a lot of that. I fine tune off of what I see you do on a concert level. Let us all humble ourselves to try to re-engage with other people. Let's reduce what's not working. So if this room is full, but it doesn't have everything that you need, throw out some of the stuff that's in there. Change the furniture around. If it's not working, get out of your room. Go into someone else's room. Be worthy enough to attract people to you. You have to be attractive to others. You have to have pur purpose. You can't come to the table to eat and just bring a menu and not be willing to wash dishes if you're not paying or treating or cooking. Yeah. Let's get back to basics. I love it. How can people get in touch with you? On Instagram, I'm at Glenn Toby, G-L-E-N-N-T-O-B-Y. The same at Facebook, the same at LinkedIn. Uh, my uh, website is drglentoby.com. And you can find things about my new book that's come out. The Asian Power League, that's which right. we just I got authored, it right here. I'm going to show it. I'll show it to I'm, everybody kind of on YouTube. Reading. This is the this is his new book, The Asian Power League. There you go. It's a thriller, a little bit of a novel there. And what we're doing, uh, and you know, Jason, you're big on education. You're a re-educator. I mean, your 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 background is education, right? But what we're doing again at Blue at uh, Blue Institute, it's uh, Blue University. It's Book Bank Institute, and we're inviting so many people. Uh, to join us. We're doing a 52-week course. We're offering scholarships. A person has to just pay the initial fee. They can leave and come as they want. It is life-changing. They find leaders like yourself, successful business people with common sense teaching tools, and we are pushing that more than everything. I, I, people are coming in. It's changing their life. So this Book Bank Institute is so important to me. Um, I'm meeting people who are, have vast wealth with people who just have a passion to change. And it's amazing. Well, look him up, everybody. It's Glenn with two N's, Glenn Toby, T-O-B-Y. Glenn, such an honor to have you here, man. And I appreciate your, your honesty. I appreciate your vulnerability, telling us a little bit about your story and, 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 and how you became who you are today. But I think most of all, I want to appreciate the fact that you're doing so much to give back. You didn't just start off as this hip-hop guy who made a bazillion dollars and is just spending it all on himself and and, uh, and and girls and drugs and all like you're actually turning that into the good which is what i said earlier the wealth in the right hands makes the world a better place and i think i'm glad that the wealth is in your hands thank you sir and i'm uh, looking up to you and i look forward to and a I long term you, friendship with this thank you honor so there you go guys this is uh this is why this is why i do this show right i do this show 
because I get to sit across the table from somebody like Dr. Glenn Toby, Sweetie G, right? The, who has, who has uh, succeeded in so many ways, not only in, in finance, because that's just one part of success, but in all the things that he wanted to achieve, he was able to achieve it because he had passion and he was in the right place at the right time, like we talked about. He, he knew the right people, he was prepared, he had a good plan. These are the things that you need to be successful. And listen to his example, listen to his advice he gave there at the end for you who has not yet done anything. You got to do it. It's time to do it. Like, like let, he even used the, his, his, his experience with fear. Fear is a motivator. I'm not going to be like that anymore. I'm going to be better than that. So I want to encourage you to do that. I'm the real Jason Duncan. You can follow me on Instagram, LinkedIn, or YouTube at the real Jason Duncan. And part of what I do to give back to the entrepreneurial community every week is one person, one entrepreneur somewhere in the world gets one free coaching session with me. I'm a business coach. We work on one real problem. It's the real Jason Duncan with a real entrepreneur and a real problem. And I will work through with you to get you that one problem solved. Totally free. You go to therealjasonduncan.com slash free coaching. And you can sign up for that. My team looks at all the applications every week. We pick one person who gets to do that. And maybe that could be you. And I would love for you to sign up to get that one free hour coaching. Now, if you want to get involved in a group cohort or a mastermind or something like that, obviously, you can just reach out to me through my website, therealjasonduncan.com. And Glenn was so kind to talk about my university, Results University, and you can take courses on there. And, and the students are loving that. And then as, a, as an aside, I know the founder of Blue University. He just mentioned that, and I would also recommend them. It's a little bit different curriculum, aimed at a little different audience, but still kind of the same concept. I would give them a plug because I, I love Dan and I love what they're doing over there at Blue and Glenn, of course, being involved in that. So there you go. That's the root of all success. Tune in again next time when we get together with another super successful entrepreneur and talk with him or her about his or her amazing journey to success and how they built a successful company and how you can too. I'm the real Jason Duncan. Until next time, remember this, Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success.